Welcome to the Great Reset Opportunity Report. I'm Chris Blasey. I'm pleased to have as our guest today, Michael Oliver. Michael has an extensive professional career that includes working directly on the floor of the Commodities Exchange as a trader of precious metals and also as a technical analyst. He is the founder of Momentum Structural Analysis, which is a provider of technical and financial analysis since 1992. MSA is based on his own momentum-based method developed in the 1980s. In 1987, Mike technically anticipated and caught the crash of that year, and it was then that he decided to develop his own structural momentum tools into a full analytic methodology. He is also the author of the book, The New Libertarianism, Anarcho-Capitalism. Michael, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Chris. Thanks for inviting me. Great to have you here, Michael. Now, as you know, this show is focused on what we call the Great Reset, and we think that's going to be profound changes macroeconomically and geopolitically. And we would like to kick off by getting our guest's opinion about the Great Reset. And also, the show is focused on the opportunities for investors that are going to come about from the Great Reset. So just to kick things off, it's a term that's being used by more and more people, but everyone's got a different definition. Um, so how would you define and uh, describe the Great Reset? Well, actually, uh, I uh, Momentum Structural Analysis, uh, MSA, my, my company, uh, used a term starting in 2016, the tectonic plate shift. And I had not heard of the Great Reset at that point. And I, frankly, I like the Great Reset better. It, it sort of sums it up better than the, just the tectonic plate movement between the four asset categories. But we identified then that probably we're have, going to have major trend changes in the major four economic uh, categories, uh, debt markets, forex, commodities, and stocks. And stocks were the laggard. Uh, they've now recently shown their hand, and we've declared it a bear market, uh, despite uh, not being 20% off the high, a silly notion in the first place. But uh, we have enough evidence that the top is in place, including for the U.S. market, which has, of course, been the strongest of the developed markets. So the Great Reset, it, it, I have a fundamental background as well that uh, we do not allow to interfere with our technical work, uh, but it's long been my view philosophically as a, as a writer in, in, of libertarian ideas uh, that the system, the status system of fiat currencies and things associated with it, such as the use of those currencies to fund government debt because they can't fund it through taxation, that ultimately this, this would snowball into a crisis that, that gets them, not certain particular areas of markets. So for example, uh, our last two major drops in the U.S. stock market, we can blame on the dot-com. So government is free and clear of that problem, supposedly, and that's not the case, actually. And the 2008 collapse, which you could go blame on some greedy banks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, both of those are central bank-generated uh, situations that have oscillated over the since Nixon cut us off uh, the gold from the dollar in international exchange in 1971, 72, I think 71, I guess. Uh, at that point, forward fiat currencies went wild because Deuce is wild, not just for us, but for all the other major ones. Well, that also impacts the debt markets, which ultimately impacts the stock markets, which affects commodities and so forth. So all these things are tied together. And so the Great Reset includes the whole deal. It's not just, not just the housing market at one time, or, or et cetera. This time, it's going to be major across the board, and it will be a reset, meaning that when you finish this time, I believe, this is where I like the term reset, you're not back to where you started again. Each time we've done it before, and I say we, when the, the central banks and the governments have done it before, they blame it on some private sector, gives them an excuse to have more power, more control, and that generates even a bigger boom the next time because of their inflationary policies, their interest rate policies, the coercive pricing of assets. That's what I call it. In fact, it is. I mean, when you coercively price money at a certain level that's below a market rate, you know, like zero or negative or close to zero, uh, you know it's unreality and it's only accomplished because they have a monopoly, a coercive monopoly over the money. And so forth. And, and I, have, I just have to interject, you know, when people will argue that there's no manipulation in markets, I say setting interest rates isn't that manipulation. Uh, absolutely. Right. 
and that's all public, right? And, and they act as if that's not a form of manipulation. And at the end of the day, that's probably the highest form of manipulation because that affects everything. And it is nobody that isn't affected by that because Absolutely. the money is the bloodstream of the economy. And therefore, if you, you change the quantity of the money units, the fiat currencies, which they do, you know, our money supply M2 has gone up uh, 4,600% since 1959. It's roughly, uh, it's not quite doubling every decade. And fairly uniformly, by the way, I've gone back and studied it. Uh, you know, it sometimes will go up 150%, sometimes 80, but it averages out to 90 plus percent doubling of the money units measured by M2 since 1959. Uh, and the oscillations that we see in related markets, you know, become more compressed, they go higher, they go lower, and it's getting more and more severe each time. And this time I think it will be the worst of all because of reasons we all know. We've had uh, six to 10 years of uh, artificial money uh, cost, money pricing that's mm -hmm. off the page. And anybody would have laughed at it. Uh, you know, if you'd said five, 10 years ago, we could have zero interest rates or negative. Uh, they would have considered that insane. Even if they're supporters of central banks, they would have considered it insane. But we've had that. So the cause of the bust is, of course, the excess of the boom. And at the core of the excess is monetary issues, central bank-related issues. It's going to come back in their lap this time. They can't blame it on somebody else. So the next time the chaos hits all the markets, not just one, uh, the central banks will not be able to say, well, it's their fault. There's enough people around the world in places of government, and possibly not in central controlled areas of the government, but you know, in, in senates and congresses, uh, even the prime minister of Austria now, you know, <laughs> a young kid who's somewhat anti-EC uh, and so forth. Uh, there's enough people in Germany that remember, that know, and obviously somebody in Germany has been bringing back the gold mm -hmm. from Fed vaults, from Paris vaults, and doing it aggressively, the last five years or so. So they know something is going on unless they just want to look at the gold bars. They, they have a reason for that. So there's enough intellect and people in position to act differently this time post the crisis instead of just, oh, let's do it again. Uh, this time we don't think it's going to happen. I think it will be a reset. Yeah, and we agree with you. So we want to understand a little bit more because you have some very interesting um, analytical tools that you've developed that are proprietary. So we know you, you observe the markets, the four major asset categories, and you have a methodology you call momentum analysis. So that's a proprietary uh, uh, methodology, we'll say. So tell us a little bit more about it. And is this, are your tools showing new emerging markets or opportunities for investors? Yeah, the uh, use of price charts as a, you know, technical analysis, drawing lines on price charts. That's the orthodoxy since Edwards and McGee wrote their book, Technical Analysis for Stock Trends, back I think in the 1940s or 50s. It's been the orthodox. And there have been a few little nuances here and there. You go to your quote screen and you've got a little thing called RSI, which is sort of a momentum indicator and there's MACD. So a lot of people think they know what momentum is. And we don't, we don't treat momentum that way. Those are like wet noodle indicators. They, you know, they tend to go up and down. We look for structural breakages in momentum. Now, in order to plot that, what we do is we don't trust price because of the distortions in the money metrics. What? Well, the dollar, if it doubles in quantity every 10 years, I mean, if you have a stock that's $40 and 10 years later it's uh, 48, you think it's gone up, uh, you know, 20%. Well, factor out the monetary distortion, uh, you know, in the, in the measuring unit. The same is true with fundamental analysis that uses things like the dollar sales of a company year to year. Uh, the measured in a money unit, euros, yen, whatever. Well, the money units are, are fluid. Uh, it's like having a yardstick that, that you're a contractor, you build a house and you've got yardsticks you use and they say 36 inches long, your project takes you a year to complete. The yardstick grows two, three inches during that time, but it still says 36 inches. So you still think the money unit's objective. Well, of course that doesn't happen, fortunately, otherwise we'd have buildings collapsing. Uh, but that does happen with the money units. Consequently, if it's fundamental analysis or orthodox technical based on the money unit, the dollar price of a stock, uh, for example, or the, any asset you're measuring, it's distorted. So how do you get away from that? Well, you can't totally get away from it. I mean, they try to use the CPI or some government issued metric of what the inflation rate is, which is usually totally erroneous. That doesn't compensate for it. So what we do is we measure a market in relation to a mean. 
a moving average, but not in the simple way that most people do, which is to plot the price and then put a moving average on the price chart. That's, that doesn't help. Crossing a moving average is next to meaningless. You see, go look at a chart of some stock in a 200 day line. You'll see it oscillates it frequently. Uh, it's a, it often, a, it's a coin toss whether it means anything. What we do is we measure price and its relationship to that moving average or to various moving averages. Uh, like you want to look long term at something, measure it against a three year moving average. Uh, if you're concerned about the next two weeks, you go look at a three day moving average or a three week. But we measure an asset or a market in relation to various means, long term, intermediate, short term. And when we plot those charts, just like when you plot a price chart, you will often see trends emerge. In the case of momentum, the trends will often be very apparent, whereas they're not so much on the price chart. And almost all the time when you have a trend change, from top to bottom, bottom to top, uh, you'll see it first on momentum. The breakout will occur first. You'll have a warning. And so rather than chasing something 20% off a low or selling it 20% off a high before you realize that you're in a bear market, for example, uh, you might be in 5% off the high or 2% off the high. For example, we got bearish on the S&P at 2915, October the 5th. Well, we were 40 points off the high, 30 points off the high. We added some more different levels on the way down, not as price broke something, but as long-term momentum factors broke structures, structures that anybody could see if you plotted the oscillator as we do. And so yes, it's proprietary, but it's, it's really not mystical or anything. It's, uh, it's quite simplistic. We apply basically the same rules the price chart technicians do, but we do it with momentum. So it sounds like what you really are able to identify is pretty much ideally suited for the type of changes that we're expecting. And we're seeing the, those changes. We yeah, are. with the great reset. So I know that early on when you were developing your analytical models, tools, you identified and you saw the crash coming in 1987. And I don't know what it showed before 2008. But do you see any parallels in the research now and your, what, your, what your information, your data is showing you now that you saw prior to, two, to 1987 yeah. or 2008? The, the difference now is this. Uh, we, we did, and we, you can go to our site and there's a PowerPoint video that shows our analysis of the S&P going back to 1994, a firm that started in 92. And various tops and bottoms, and we, we got them all. We got them very early before anybody realized there was a major trend change, including bottoms, not just tops. Uh, what we're seeing now is similar if you focus only, on, let's say on the S&P 500. It's similar, uh, but worse looking than it was in 87. And I don't, I'm not talking about speed right now, speed of the decline, the, the various speeds. Uh, sometimes the, the faster it is, like 87 actually didn't sustain. You know, it was 30 something percent in two days and it was over and settled down and went back up because certain things during that break did not break down. Annual momentum, for example, did not break. Whereas in 2000 and 2007 tops, you did break annual momentum shortly thereafter. We're going to break annual momentum in this decline. We're already breaking certain aspects of it. We've broken quarterly momentum. We've broken monthly momentum, all various time scales of our measure. So we think it's very similar to 2000 and 2007 tops in the way the top has occurred and then the factors that it's breaking. However, we put out a report a week ago um, suggesting that this time could be different. It's too simple in our mind. It smacked us in the face that we did a parallel with 2000 and 2007 tops and we're similar. It can't be that it will be exactly the same again. Likely that it's going to be faster. That the, the movement from the top of the market, not, not necessarily the duration of the entire bear market, but at least the initial massive move from the top, it was arduous back in 2000 to 2001, early 2001. It was arduous from the 2007 high in October through let's say May of 2008. It, you could still debate, most people were still debating whether it was in fact still a bull or a bear. This time I think you're gonna get off the high more rapidly to where people are gonna be somewhat shocked. And I'm not necessarily saying it's gotta drop 30% overnight, but it, something worse that happened in 2000 and 2007. Now, the broader issue, we're seeing the same kind of thing happening in other asset categories. Whereas back then, for example, let's say 87, you didn't necessarily see it in other asset categories. It was limited to stock market, developed markets especially. This time I'm seeing it across asset categories. I'm seeing 
The bottom was made in precious metals with the exception of platinum, uh, which only recently made its low in our view, but we think that was a low. In what, late 2015, early 2016, moved up sharply, then settled into a range off the lows. Similarly, T-bonds, U.S. T-bond futures, 30-year bonds, topped in uh, mid-2016, collapsed hard in late 2016, broke annual momentum at that point. So again, we're talking almost two years ago, bonds changed major trend. Rates have gone up since then. Commodities made a low. Uh, the Bloomberg Commodity Index, for example, it was January of 16 or Dees of 15. Uh, you've not gone back to that low. You're holding uh, about 20% off of it. Yes, you're going sideways, so people are asleep again, but you didn't go back to that low. I think that was the low for commodities. The issue now is at what point does it become more obvious on the upside? So we've got debt has moved. Commodities have come off their low and have built their base. Gold has come well off its low. We think that right now that the, the final asset category, the stock market, which we've said before is sort of a stupid category <laughs> in terms of its awareness of what's going on. And that's often why it has sudden movements at the point of realization where they look around and say, my God, things are changing. You because know? basically it's trying to catch up. It's catching up to reality. But we think now all four asset categories have changed. We also think the dollar stopped. We think that occurred in 2017. Uh, at 10350 on the uh, dollar index. It's now trading at 96 area. It's in a nice rally, but it hasn't changed the trend. So we think Forex, the major foreign exchange units, have changed trend uh, adverse to the dollar. Um, we think a lot of other events out there, aside from markets, uh, for instance, the Chinese accumulation of gold, now the biggest gold producer in the world. Uh, Russia accumulation of gold and divestiture of U.S. T-bonds. Uh, China divesting U.S. debt. Uh, those are factors that are not market, you can't cite them, but you know, they're, they're ongoing and they have a purpose. Uh, they realize, I think, that uh, despite the fact that we call them communists, uh, they realize that fiat currencies uh, are doomed and they don't want to be in position to, when that, that great reset occurs to be the largest victim. They want to be on the winning side as they watch the turmoil in the developed world, the Western world. Uh, so I just, have to, I just have to ask you because I'll make sure I understand this right. I think one thing I'm hearing is that your research is showing that this break is going to be more rapid than what happened in 2007 and 8. And there's two schools of thought that the next break will be of a magnitude greater than 2008. And what was done to kind of bail out markets and paper things over won't be able to be accomplished now. And maybe it's just because it's going to happen so rapidly there won't even be time to react to try to, to bail things out. Well, also, they've realized this, the CBs have, that uh, they don't have much leverage anymore. Yeah. I mean, they had to pedal to the floor. And, uh, you know, when you go negative rates, you buy up uh, 10, 20 percent of your stock market like the BOJ has done. Uh, you buy Italian bonds and uh, keep their rates low like the ECB has done, keep them lower than U.S. bond rates. So give me a break. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, how do you do it again? Uh, the Fed thinks that they, if they raise rates a little bit, a couple percentage points, maybe over time, they can then have that to push back down again, you know, as a lever. Uh, it's meaningless. Uh, they don't have any tools left. And there's people around them who are in political position again, who are rising in popularity, and not always because of a philosophical movement or anything of this sort. I mean, for instance, the Trump phenomenon. Uh, he's not a libertarian coming in saying, we've got to stop this stuff. He's not even a, a normal conservative or the Austrian prime minister, or uh, the political movements in Germany that have unseated, effectively unseated Merkel. All these forces aren't tied together, they're not intellectually tied, but they're headed in a direction that says not only will markets be disturbed, but the political realm is gonna be disturbed as well. The orthodoxies are being cracked open, such that when we get to the end of this crisis, and I tend to think I, I, I like chaos theory, and we're, we think incrementally, but we watch markets, you know, they go up or they go down, usually in staircase. But I think this one's going to sweep so fast that we're going to be at that point where a lot of central banks are in panic mode again. They have to find somebody to blame. Uh, governments are talking about regulating this or that sector of the economy because it's the fault or whatever. You know, that will happen. But this time, I don't think it's going to work, and I don't think it might even gain political gravitas. I don't think it'll work politically because there's enough fracturing going on in the political side of the equation to where we're going to see chaos there as well. Could, and I think part of it, or at least in my opinion, is 
people are recognizing, as you mentioned before, around the world, whether it's the Prime Minister of Austria, you know, the stockpiling of gold by Russia, China, some other countries, that there's a sense, and it's becoming more global by more and more individuals, that there is going to be this monumental event. It's going to be, you know, the term we use, reset. So therefore, once this event starts to kick off, they're not going to be thinking about how to try to save the system because they've already decided in their mind it's not unsavable, so they're going to move to the next thing and kind of just let the markets go down, and they're not going to be willing to play along to try to bail out what they know is permanently broken. And that, you know, will, I think will then, you know, amplify and really bring about this big change, this profound reset that is being forecast. Yes, I think so. I, and I think it will happen faster this time because I think the compression of the distortion is so great over so many years. And, you know, it used to be we'd have a, a boom bust cycle where the Fed goes crazy for a year or so, yeah. you know, and they, they create a boom and then there's a bust. We've had, you know, arguably since 2011, especially even before that, but it, let's start at 2011 through present. Uh, maybe the Fed sort of detached a few years ago, but basically the, core central banks went crazy starting in 2011 and didn't let off. Therefore, the distortion this time, the end consequences will unravel in ways that we can't always forecast in terms of the level of destruction, the speed of the destruction, where it's occurring and so forth. Uh, I think it'll be pretty wide. But I think the main beneficiary of all this will be uh, real money, period. Uh, they can't dismiss it. They can laugh at it. They can say it's historical. It's an artifact, you know, whatever... Uh, Bernanke said one time at a hearing in front of Ron Paul, remember mm -hmm. that? <laughs> so why do you have gold there? So I don't know, it's an artifact, you know. Uh, that will come to the fore. The Chinese know it. And it wouldn't shock me that the, 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 the yuan and the, the ruble are, are gold back way before we ever have stable currencies here, which will be kind of historically funny if you've lived as long as, I, I you know, I'm in my late 60s, but have, have thought of the communists as, you know, an enemy troops coming over the hill type thing, which of course they're not, they're, the Chinese communists are the quote communist party, but they're really not. They've been backing toward, backing out of statism toward a more market system, you know, in a three steps forward, one step back process since the 1980s. Uh, and that's why when you see a picture of Shanghai, your jaw drops. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not a government project. There's market forces at work there. So the world's changing and uh, it's going to do it rapidly. And to some extent, we can thank the central banks for getting us to this point. Um, so, I, you know, you kind of talked about real assets, hard assets are going to be a superior uh, position during all this. But probably, at least in our opinion, in the beginning of something like this, not all hard assets are created equal. You know, some people will still say, well, real estate, but, but you know, there's a lot of counterparty risk with real estate, right? Well, Meaning buying real estate, you still need a, a viable renter, right? Leaser. Right who can make payments. So do you have any opinions on some of the major hard asset categories, which ones would be good to move into? You know, like the foods, real estate, Absolutely. physical metals. Uh, in the commodity arena, we basically like them all in 2016. And as you know, oil and copper, which are, tend to be economically associated. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Copper. They're doing well, the economy's doing well. Okay, well, oil and copper had big moves, percent-wise, uh, from 2016 lows to highs uh, this year. And they've since caved big. And in fact, they stopped where we expected them to stop and they've caved back to where we think they're probably going to start bottoming again at much higher levels than they were in 2016. But they're not the game anymore. They've had the big thrust off the lows. And while they'll probably work their way higher in the next couple of years, simply because they're commodities and they're still at relatively low levels. Uh, we think food commodities are probably the explosive arena in the commodity sector. They tried to get off out of their bases Early this year, it failed. Trump's tariff war helped do that. It, it helped collapse soybeans about 20% off their high because the Chinese reciprocated with the rule by your beans. Uh, we think that's temporary. We think the food commodities are effectively what we call theoretical zero, which you're not going to take corn to zero. You can take it to three bucks maybe. That's about as low as you can take it. And if you look at a chart of corn or soybeans or wheat over the last three or four years, all they've done is they've pounded into the same level at a low and, and laughed it up, would come back down. They haven't gone up out of their base yet, but they're not going any lower. So you can basically circle them and say, that's a value trade. I just have to jump in on the soybeans because, you know, when this whole tariff war started, 
And the Chinese first reaction was to hurt our, our soybean business by curtailing their importing of them. My opinion was, seemed kind of foolish because, you know, at the end of the day, China ships us a lot of unnecessary products, right? Just go to Walmart and all that. I mean, their people are fed by soybeans. It seemed a little foolish to basically go after a commodity that is critical to feeding your population. And I just heard yesterday there was a high level Chinese official, and you don't hear this often, who actually criticized in their administration's tactic of going right away and going after soybeans. Mm -hmm. It's like cutting off your nose to spite your face, mm -hmm. right? Well, the price of soybeans have now risen, I understand, 25% in China. Well, that affects every single person on their most basic right. needs. Mm -hmm. So, really, that's, to me, one of the reasons it was probably a temporary low in soybean, because China's going to have to back off of that. I mean, starving your people or bringing inflation at such a core level probably is not a great strategy to combat, you know, Trump's tariffs. But, right. but, but that said, you know, let me just move on to something else. Um, are there any other, just before we get off your, um, you know, what your analysis is showing, are there any particular geopolitical tensions going around or, or you know, economic um, matters around the world that you're keeping an eye on that you see as a potential trigger for, you know, this big shift, this, you know, or something that will determine and exasperate the magnitude of you know, a reset or, you know, the events coming up? Uh, I think probably the market events themselves will cause that uh, a crisis, you know, here or there. Europe, for instance, their economic growth that was picking up has gone flat again rapidly. I mean, like a light switch. Uh, so, you know, having an external issue cause, I think the market forces themselves, which is, as you just pointed out with the Chinese people, uh, it's not just a market thing. It affects the people. And so, uh, you know, they're, they're going to back off that and we'll back off the tariff thing. I suspect strongly, for example, that for, and we made this point in some recent reports, you break the stock market through the February low, which is 25.32 on the S&P, we're trading 4% above it right now. Uh, you blow that low out and change the dynamics of the year, make a new low late in the year, for example. Uh, I'll make a bet that suddenly the talks with China get better. Why? Because uh, Trump... His Trump trumped the market. You know, he says it's this is his his doing, and therefore, if it undoes itself, he can blame the other party, perhaps. But uh, he he would like to repair it, and one way to do that, and also to give him a good look, and also the Chinese leader to look good to his people, including the businessmen of China, is to make some kind of deal. So I suspect that the first thing that's going to happen is going to look good, and that is the tariff war ameliorates uh, somehow. It doesn't actually happen, and uh, soybeans go up, for example. That's one consequence. Uh, that also might generate a rally in the stock market. And I think that's what Trump would like, is if he makes this deal suddenly in the dark, which, you know, that's the way he likes to do it, and springs it, and it looks real good, the stock market rallies. Well, we expect the stock market to rally at some point, not from here. We think the rally will probably occur after they blow out the February lows and go, we think, down around 20, high 2300s, low 2400s. Uh, and from that point, they might generate a decent rally, not a one week rally, but something that lasts maybe, maybe a month. Uh, and it'll be news cost, but it won't change the overall direction of that that was a top and we're entering a bear market. All bear markets have counter trend rallies and we're looking for one, but we don't think it's coming from here. We think it's coming from a shock level. And the market in itself will have two uh, effects, one on Trump and the Chinese, I think. By the way, their stock market's already starting to firm and look pretty good to us compared to Western markets. And two, have an effect on Powell at the Fed. Uh, you know, he may hold his chest out and say, no, we're going to continue with this policy because the numbers look good. All of a sudden, he's going to have some numbers that don't look so good. And so we think that's going to neutralize him for a while. What's that going to do? That's going to have an effect on the dollar. Okay, so all these things are tied together. So it's hard to say which causes which. Sure. So I want to uh, just focus a little bit and uh, on the precious metals market because a lot of our listeners and viewers, um, you know, are very interested in that. And you know, your career started off as a futures broker, and I know you had a lot of experience, uh, direct experience with the precious metals. So, gold has been trading basically in a fairly narrow range for a bit now. So, based on your analysis, your tools, you know, people kind of want to know what a person, an expert's forecast is. 
looking out at 2019 and maybe just a little beyond that, 2020. So for the short and intermediate term, you know, where do you see gold trading and what are the drivers that you believe support what your forecast is for, for gold? Well, let's, I'm going to step away from what are the drivers because we know what the drivers are. We've been talking about them and I don't want to wander off into fundamentals because we are cold. We're technicians of our own making uh, momentum structural analysis. Uh, sums it up. And what we see there is not what the price chart people see. Let's talk about gold for now. Gold made the low at 1046 in December 2015. By summer 2016, it was 1370s. Whoosh off the low. It was a vacuum. We got bullish at 1140 in early February 2016 and have not altered that view in terms of long term annual momentum meaning the annual momentum trend topped in 2012. We call the top there. It took it till 2013 to finally crash. And then from the 2013 crash low, which is under 1,200, having dropped from 1,700 under 12 rapidly, mm -hmm. it staircased its way down to a low in 2015, again at 1,046. Then we shot up off that low and went into a range now in gold for the last couple of years. Most of that activity has been in the high 1100s up to the repeatedly above 1350, more like 1360 in 2016, 2017, and 2018. It's almost a crew cut on a price chart. So most technicians flip out a price chart and they'll go back three or four years and they'll see this shelf of resistance that has constantly stopped the market. It stopped us again this year, 1360 area. We think that one, when you go through that, every price technician in the world is going to wake up and say, my gosh, it's been answered. It's a bull market. Okay. They're waiting for that. We don't want to wait for that. Our next signal in gold, and again, our primary signal was 1140, in February 2016. All the action since then, noise, large noise, small noise. Right now, gold is 1230s. Uh, its recent high has been just above 1240. We think if you close out a week, in the next few weeks. And this number goes down each week a couple, couple dollars. It adjusts down based on some momentum factors. Much above that high that we just made, 1242, I think it was two, three weeks ago. We think you're gonna launch then up toward 1300 pretty rapidly. At that point, we have our last number. And that number again changes by $2 per week. By the end of the year, if you close out a week late in December, in the upper 1280s, we think that that 1360 price chart stuff that everybody's looking at is gone. We think to, in order to blow that out, all the momentum says you need to do is get up into the very upper 1200s, especially later this year, the number adjusts down. We think you cross that threshold, we think the price chart stuff up there that everybody sees will be blown out rapidly. So our last buy signal is gonna be in the upper 1200s as we approach the end of the year. So that's what we're looking in the, in the mid 1240s and then the upper 1200s as our last two signals. The stuff everybody else sees above 1360 is price chart noise. And we think it will come out rapidly. Then the question is, well, and what, where are we going next? Uh, what are the staircases and so forth? And frankly, I'm open. I think gold will go much higher than we've ever seen in this bull market for its own technical reasons, but also the macro technicals that we see in the other markets. The, the, a collapse and a renewed collapse in the dollar, probably its replacement as the reserve currency, uh, possibly you know by multiple currencies, including the one, uh, which might even be gold backed at some point. But the nature of the, the the forthcoming gold market, bull market, I almost am biased enough to say that I think it's going to be far stronger and far faster than any of the prior bull markets we've seen, which will usually involve multiple years of action of upside, you know, from 1976 low to 1980 and so forth. Uh, the 2009 congestion zone to the 2011 peak. We think it might unfold more quickly. And I also think, uh, I've used the phrase before, and, and people wonder what I mean, this could be the last bull market for gold. Well, what does that mean? Is it gonna go down? No, I think once it gets up to certain levels, we'll be in the crisis. And if we're in the crisis as we perceive it to be, and I think we are, and once it becomes full fruit and everybody is aware of it, I think many fiat currencies will become gold-backed currencies, in which case you won't need to pursue gold. Gold will be there behind many currencies that will be stable at that point. And so it will effectively become the world's money again as the, the backing of a currency. Sure. So, and let me ask you this, you know, there's another um, 
school of thought out there that for individual investors, right, who acquire and own the physical, right, not looking to own a derivative, mm -hmm. right? obviously China and Russia are buying physical, that I think you're saying, and I would agree, this is a good, if you're going to accumulate, if you're either going to add to your position or get in, this is a time to do it because it's prior to things starting to blast off. And we're of the opinion, and others are also, that once it blasts off, the actual ability to acquire the physical for a, 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 a regular investor is not going to be very easy. The, no. the availability, regardless of price, price will indicate that it's available, but I don't really necessarily believe that's so. That you know, if you're the individual who's been sitting on the sidelines saying, I'm gonna go buy 100 ounces of gold, once this crisis starts rolling, once the crisis starts rolling, that may be too late for a regular inter, you know, investor, especially if gold is, become, is going to be, play a bigger and bigger part back in currencies of the world. Mm -hmm. right? There's mm -hmm. going to be a lot of very big sovereign powers who are going to be on the front of the line for any physical availability. Now, do you have any opinion of that, or do you think that regards to the price, the physical will always be available for an individual investor. Well, we know in history that they've often blocked uh, citizens from owning gold. For example, in 75, it was legal again for Americans. Uh, it had been, uh, Roosevelt had removed that. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it, by the way, it was a group in New Orleans called uh, Committee to Legalize Gold. It was a, a libertarian group that got it through Congress. Uh, yeah. And for some reason it passed. And I think even people who voted for it didn't quite know what they were opening up there, uh, the potential for American to own gold again. The Chinese, for example, uh, legalized gold for their citizens in 2002 uh, after they had spent a couple decades accumulating a lot of gold for government. <laughs> Once they got their fair share, <laughs> then they opened it up to the public. Uh, their public can't buy foreign exchange, but they can buy gold, and they do. Uh, so, you know, you could have the reversion where some governments might, might – declared off limits again, but I, I tend to think not. I think in the internet world we're in, where borders become less and less meaningful in terms of people trading ideas and physical objects, I tend to think it'll be available. But on the other hand, I think it's, there's nothing more reassuring than having some physical, uh, you know, and not just ETFs. Yes. Uh, yeah, you wanna make some quick money or you know, the next year or two, that's good, but having the physical could be very important and also reassuring and, uh, you know, and it's not just gold, I mean, Silver, I think, which has been a dog compared to gold, though if you look at it carefully from the 2015 low to the 16 rally high, when gold went up uh, several hundred dollars, silver outpaced it vastly. Though yeah, which, which is gonna bring me to my next, quest, next question, right? We, you know, it's always been preached to everybody in, in portfolio, you know, building out a portfolio about diversification, right? Not only in asset classes, but within an asset class. Yes. And, you know, the precious metals, there are four metals, right? The gold, silver, platinum, palladium. And usually everyone just refers to gold as uh, to refer to gold itself or even as the proxy to represent the precious metals mm -hmm. market. Mm -hmm. Now, our firm, we're, we're very big believers in the value of the silver, platinum, palladium also. But I'd be very interested. We'd love to hear your opinion on silver, platinum, palladium within a portfolio in conjunction with gold? Well, obviously they, they perform differently. For example, uh, we watch platinum uh, on and off uh, and it's completely deviated from gold in the sense that it made a low in 2015 and rallied like gold, but then it made a new low recently. Be like gold being under 1,050 uh, instead of, you know, 1,200s. Uh, our technical analysis of platinum says, no, nope, this is still a massive base. The fact that it made a new low, marginal new low, taking out a low of a couple of years ago, was what we call a bear trap. I mean, it, yes, the price chart guys got alarmed. They put their sell stops in. They ran because it broke, broke to a new low. It didn't sustain the new low. It whipped right back up into the range. And uh, we think it basically platinum goes up about $100 from where it is right now. It's gone. It's going to take off again. Uh, price chart says one thing momentum structure, annual momentum in this case, where we measure platinum price in relation to a three-year average, for example, uh, com a totally different picture than you see on the price chart. And the momentum chart says this is a massive base. This is not a congestion zone to prior to sustainable new lows. It's not going to happen. So we think platinum, which has been the weakest of the entire group of four there, palladium is the strongest, of course, of course uh, can whipsaw up out of here pretty quickly. So you get these swings over time where you know, platinum might, I remember a decade or two ago, platinum was outpacing gold and, uh, you know, and, and people think it was the new gold. Well, it wasn't true, but still it was good. 
But I think right now, Platinum happens to be probably in the best slingshot position it's ever been in, in terms of regaining some status. So percent-wise, it wouldn't shock me that Platinum outpaces gold over the next year, let's say. Uh, silver in the long run, I think, will beat gold. It normally does in the long run. Right now, in this still basing process, uh, silver's be not, not behaving as well. But when we go to long-term analysis of the spread relationship between silver and gold, you know, ounces of silver to buy an ounce of gold, Though that looks weak on the surface, the momentum of it doesn't look weak. Uh, same is true with gold miners. But in terms of the, the metals themselves, we think that silver is likely to outpace gold in this next bull market. And they call it what the poor man's gold. Mm -hmm. uh, I think platinum, because of the technical position it put itself in, in this last sell-off, is now in a position to regain more rapidly uh, in, in that group of four. So, yeah, there are arguments that... Uh, to be balanced in the group of four, absolutely. Yeah, we agree. I mean, especially, it, we think it helps smooth the ride out. As you said, you know, after five, 10 years, just imagine if the metals all gave the same return, you know, a diversified portfolio will have a smoother ride because they don't move in lockstep. I mean, mm -hmm. platinum and silver are great examples since things backed off in 2011, 12, you know, silver really came down tremendously, you know, much more than gold. But I, you know, we agree that silver has an exceptionally bright future and, uh, you know, probably on a percentage basis will outperform gold, but it can be a very bumpy, painful ride. But it has been for the last few years, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Michael, you know, this was, a, this was a great interview and I'd like to wrap up by not just thanking you, but telling us where people can learn more about you and your services and, uh, you know, the products that you offer. Well, it's the site is uh, Oliver. MSA for Momentum Structural Analysis, OliverMSA.com. And uh, we have, uh, you can request sample reports. We have two different products. One is our general product, which is, covers all four asset categories of the debt markets, Forex, commodities, and stocks. Uh, also globally, we don't just, it's not just domestic. Uh, and then we have a new report we came out with a few months ago called the Gold, Silver, and Mining Report, which is focused only on that area. It includes platinum in there as well with precious metals themselves and the miners. Uh, and that's uh, much cheaper. It's $2.99 a year. Our other report is uh, $4.75 a quarter. Uh, it, we find a lot of institutions, registered investment advisors, and large uh, investors uh, are happy. It's a fairly high price compared to the retail market. But it covers a lot of, uh, in depth. It's like you get a report a day, uh, and we cover everything from Bitcoin to corn. You know, it's, it's quite, the, the, the menu is big, okay? Uh, the other one is very narrow. And we reason we issued the Gold Silver Mining Report recently is because we think it's going to be a point of focus. Simple as that. We think it's something that will be in demand. People understand the fundamentals of gold. The issue is timing. Mm -hmm. We think we do well at timing. Well, that's great. Uh, Michael, hopefully we can have you on again in the future, right? As this, uh, as these events unfold and people are going to be looking for an update and, uh, you know, a forecast going further out. So again, thanks for coming on. Hope to have you on in the future. It's going to be fun the next few years. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Take care.